So, but then I thought it said final, so I thought it was on, be on the consent, and they couldn't ask. The them. planning department felt that uh, that uh, there was no need for them to go through two reviews of this. Oh, okay, but it's just on do the... it all at one time. Okay, then I can ask. It. Okay, thanks.
Okay, let's call to order the Urban Design Commission meeting for Wednesday, January 28, 2009. We start with a roll call. Kowalski, Kimmerer. Here. Riggs. Here. Doherty. Here. Anya. Here. Kastik. Here. Coleman. Templin. Here. Joyner. Here. Okay, we have a couple of packets of minutes. Can we get a motion on the minutes for Tuesday, December 2nd? Commissioner Briggs has moved and it's been seconded by Doug Gassick. So, any discussion? Any objection to passing the motion? Seen them. It passes. How about the minutes for Wednesday, December 10th? A motion for approval on those. Commissioner Joyner has moved. It's been seconded by Commissioner Ania. Any discussion? Any opposition to accepting those minutes? 
Seeing none, those minutes are accepted. Moving on to disclosures. Any commissioners have any disclosures to make for tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, for case 2009-008, Walmart Stores, uh, the company I represent, Land Design North, is the landscape architect, and I would need to recuse myself from that case. Uh, just FYI, there was an email that we got. The petitioner is actually going to ask to postpone that case, so uh, I don't think we'll be hearing it tonight. Disclosure for the same case, um, the, my former employer, I was the project manager on this uh, in earlier in its phases. Okay. Again, I don't think we'll be hearing that case tonight. Any other disclosures? Okay. So let's move to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion for approval from Commissioner Kemplin, seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Does anybody like to poll any cases? Commissioner Joyner? Uh, yes, I'd like to poll case 2008 uh, 9th Avenue. Okay. Any others? Commissioner Briggs? I'd like to pull case 2004-072 um, for Chester Valley Elementary School. Any other cases need to be pulled off the consent agenda? I do need to make a disclosure. If uh, for 2008-058, uh, my employer is the landscape architectural firm for that case, and I would need to be recused for a discussion on it. Okay. Okay, we'll be excusing you for that case tonight. <clears throat> so, any other disclosures or cases to be pulled from the consent agenda? No? So, the matter before us is the consent agenda without these two cases? Anybody have any objection to passing the cases? Seeing no objection. Those cases pass. So let's hear 2004-072, um, which is the Chester Valley Elementary School project. We need a staff report. Mr. Chair, we don't normally do a staff report. If there's someone here from representing that case that has a question or something what they want to bring to the attention of the commission, and then I also have a modification to one of the conditions. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Elise Haggins. I'm with Earthscape and working for the Anchorage School District. With me here, I do have some school district people, and John Weir, who's with McCool Carlson Green, the architect of record on the project. Um, we thank you for pulling us from the um, consent agenda. The school district, um, uh, we, the design team in the school district, would like to review the department recommendations with um, specific concerns for recommendation two, which I believe is on your page five of the file. Um, th this issue has come up uh, recently on a couple of school district projects, and I think it will come up again. Um, the school district is taking an active um, role in reviewing the proposed Title 21 um, with regard to buffers around schools, especially elementary schools. Um, the, the idea that elementary schools are, are neighborhood schools and they're supposed to be part of neighborhoods is contrary to the, the desire to create 15-foot wide buffer zones or noise fences and, and create these big mega barriers for schools. Um, and, and the school district is, uh, Maud Balave has been pursuing that with the Title 21 committee even to the point of, of taking that issue to the assembly. Um, Earthscape has done um, 
a lot of work with schools, and, and, and we agree very much with the notion that schools shouldn't, especially elementary schools, shouldn't be barriers to the neighborhood. The school district depends on the eyes of its neighbors. They have data that shows that schools that have neighbors that look out over them have far fewer maintenance and vandalism issues than schools that are hidden or in the backwoods. So, so there's an actual record that shows there's, there's this good thing that happens between schools, elementary schools, and, and adjacent neighborhoods. Based on that, that's one issue we'd like you to think about with, with this request. The other one is we, we do understand that the code says that this should be, um, this isn't always an enforced part of the code since we've been doing school designs. Um, it's not incredibly new, but, but one of the things we'd ask you to consider in this situation, um, there's no work that's being done on the school that impacts, the, the, the school really isn't changing. The school's been there um, since, been there for 40 years. Um, the neighbors know what they have, and, and that's actually one of the concerns the design team has. When we worked years ago with the neighbors on this project, um, there's a desire to keep that openness between the school and those neighbors. Uh, the neighbors, and, and one of the facts that I would tell you about that is in the 40 years that the school has been here, um, there's a chain link fence that surrounds the entire site. This lot and two lots down are the only people that have solid wood fences on this property. So out of this whole neighborhood in a 40-year period, only two of the neighbors have chosen to provide that separation to this school. So we'd ask you to consider that. We'd also ask you to consider that, that there's really no substantial change to this side of the school. Um, to provide a barrier all along here, we think, um, hurts the integrity of the school, hurts the integrity of the neighborhood, and definitely um, doesn't help us with safety in terms of visibility into the school. On this site here, um, because we are introducing um, a drainage swale, and this is almost creating a, a rain garden, um, we're amenable. We, right now we've put all deciduous trees. If we meet that buffer standard, we're required to put in 50% evergreen trees. And, and we are willing to do that um, because we have the space. And um, the, the preference, though, is, is it's really going to create, um, it's going to block the school a lot more than, than it's blocked now, and we'll lose that open feeling. So that's item number two that we'd like you to discuss or, or work with us on. Um, item number three, um, specifications that specify the contractor will be responsible for replanting of all plant materials damaged by moose. The school district is, is amenable to that. Item number four, um, provide the eight-foot minimum with the inaccessible parking. The school district will do that. Item five, we will work with the traffic department to, and we, we do appreciate you're not making us come back to you. We will work with the traffic department. Um, there's some issues with that um, raised um, pedestrian crossing that, that we have in terms of maintenance, but also in terms of where's the best location for it given the, the site layout. So we'll work with the traffic department on that. Um, item number six, consider planting additional and relocating some trees um, north of the sledding hill. We, we actually worked on a um, wind study um, a couple of years ago in the valley and found that you really need an enormous amount of space to make an adequate wind buffer. Um, and we just don't have the space here. We, we will look at, at shifting things and moving things a little bit, but, but to create a truly adequate wind barrier, um, you need upwards of 60 to 100 feet. Um, to make a difference, and plus 20 years of tree growth. Um, item number seven, um, consider spacing the white ash. And, and actually, we've done more than that. We've changed the front entry design, and, and I can hand that out if that's okay with people. Okay. Oh, maybe we should hand that out. Um, and what we've done along the, the front of the school. We actually deleted the ash. Um, the design team felt that um, repeating some of the pattern with the columnar aspen, given these, um, the configuration of window bays and concrete um, panels on the building, that, that creating this, this pattern across the front of the building that, that followed the same pattern we had here was um, a little bit better than, than the grouping of 
from the grouping of ash trees that we had there. So we'd ask that you um, consider that instead of, um, or that you consider that, that that maybe gets rid of item number seven on the list. So with that, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, you covered it. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I, I have a question, Elise. Okay, go ahead. Um, could you point out where where the buffer landscaping is not achieved? It looks like it's on the north from there across that entire length. So staff has provided us with the option of a, a barrier, a noise barrier type wall there, and um, we're just really concerned with that. How much space do you have there between your play equipment? Or five feet. Five? Between five and six feet, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we could cram plants into there. My, our preference would be to cram plants in there and, and not have this big solid wood barrier. Um, but, but we'd really prefer to leave it the way it's been for years and years and years. And along the south edge? It looks like the buffer is achieved. Right. So what happened along the south edge is that there was a mass tree that came down about here, cottonwood trees, the neighbor doesn't complaining about them. So in the moving of the hotness and regrading, we're regrading to make the drainage. The neighbors also have a problem with drainage issues. So to solve the drainage issues, we regrade, and we're replacing some of the landscape. We're replacing the lawn. With tree masses. The original intent was to group those trees to allow views into the site. Um, but the other concern, um, Alan, you're, you're reminding me of this because I'm seeing winter cities here. Uh, one of the other concerns with these buffers is that if we put uh, that 15 foot buffer with trees 50% evergreen, we provide significant shade into the neighbor's yards um, in, in 20 years when the trees get big. Has there been any, any discussion with the neighbors regarding landscaping to yeah. buffer their houses from the uh, school? Uh, yes. Um, when we, in 05, we went through this process and we have had public meetings where the community is invited to the school and we've had good feedback on the current design that we have. So I think we've done that both in 05 and, and more recently as we've gone through this uh, design and finished it. But we, we have never gone to them with a 15-foot buffer because that's kind of a new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And are, are there fences along that edge, along that property line? They're, they're all chain link. It's all your standard six-foot tall chain link fence on that whole side. It, it looks like there's an easement on the north side of that property line. Is that a, a electrical or subsurface? Yeah, they're like a, there's a gas easement and there's a some electrical on the south. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Briggs. And just to, uh, to reiterate then, so for the adjacent neighbors, there have never been any complaints about those kids <coughs> making lots of noise or the swings creaking? No, nothing. Thank you. I mean, we've not heard anything during the, you know, three or four years we've been working on this on and off. And more recently, it's been you know, coming to a head, we've been having public meetings at the school and it's been, there hasn't been anybody who's come in and said, there's too much noise, you know. So. We have Mr. Grumpy though. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> there is one guy. But it hasn't been noise. Before. It hasn't been noise, it's just been people. Well, well, I already meant visual as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think we're, I mean, there's only been one guy, he's, it was just people touching the fence, not the fact that he couldn't see in there, just that they would touch the fence. So I believe he had it electrified. <laughs> yeah. uh, Commissioner Joyner, did you have something? Yes, I had one question. On, it's kind of a tree spacing too, but on the islands in the parking lot, how wide are those? Those islands, I think, are 22 feet wide. 20 or 22 feet. And you can kind of see if the parking space is about 10 feet. That's almost, Those are, oh, maybe they're 18 feet. Um, the islands that have the amitrope trees in them, yeah. And those are five trees that get a 30 foot wide crown. 
not for the school district. Yeah, that's about that's about a 16 to 20 foot wide island. Um, yeah, it seems very small for that many trees that could get big if they had space to. Did you want my comment on that? Have you been to my yard? <laughs> we, 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 it is a tight spacing, um, but the options are to put fewer trees and, and, and have this uncomfortable ground cover situation that we know if we put that many trees in there, we're creating the sage, shade situation and we have a mulch that, that we can keep the weeds down because the trees shade it. Um, so aimer truck trees are used specifically because they don't mind being root bound, they don't mind drought, they're a very tolerant parking lot tree, they're very tolerant of being crowded. On the other side they are fast growing, they have a weak wood system. Um, so there's that, that trade off as well. But we do realize we're putting a, a quite a mass of trees in there. Yeah, that, seem, that does seem excessive for that kind of a tree. So I'm familiar with the tree and it does well. But another expense. They'll also need, you probably know they're going to need a good central leader, which they often don't have if they're going to be up above parking, pedestrian kinds of things. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Sharon? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just quickly on a um, condition number six. The intent there was not to create really a wind barrier, but just make, perhaps add a few more trees on the north side or relocate some of the trees that are on the east side to the, to the north side just to help block some of the wind and maybe add a few shrubs there as well. And then more on that uh, condition number two. Um, Rob Balave with the school district sent an email to the planning director today and several of, of us met with, the, with Tom Nelson this afternoon, late this afternoon, about four o'clock. So it was myself, two other staff members and Tom Nelson uh, met to discuss Mr. Bal Balave's email and he was concerned with having to provide the 15 foot um, landscape buffer around the uh, perimeter of the school. And what it all comes down to in the end is that neither the planning department nor the UDC has the authority to waive a code requirement. So what the school district may do in this situation if they find that they're not able to provide the 15 feet, then their only recourse is to seek a variance from Zeba. Um, while we're sympathetic with their situation there, uh, we cannot decide to, to apply the code requirements based on, do, you know, are the neighbors bothered by it or they're not bothered by it. Those are circumstances that we don't consider when we're, you know, applying code requirements, what, what the neighbors um, feel and what the history has been, um, the code applies is the, the bottom line there. Um, Oh, and I do need to make a modification to number two. Staff had put the language in there about, um, you know, if they find that they can't put the 15-foot landscape buffer in there, that they may, um, as a mitigation me measure, put in a sound barrier fence. And that I'm going to have to modify so that the second sentence there in condition number two should be um, deleted. And it will read um, AMC 2145-200 requires 15-foot buffer landscaping between single-family residential and, and institutional uses. The north, south, and east sides of the site abut single-family residential and is subject to this requirement. So with the addition of east there and then uh, deletion of that second sentence. Thanks. I, I did have a question, um, and it had to do with just the uh, the nature of the of the parent drop off. Um, 
Is this a reconfiguration of traffic um, in the new in your new south parking lot designed for a drop off, or um, has that always been used as the as the parent drop off? There has been an upgrade. There was an upgrade this last summer. They had uh, the bus drop off has always been there. The south parking lot was revised under its current configuration that you see now last summer, and we're just extending the parking lot. Um, further to the east. But I, I might, at least Higgins here, I might add to that that this parking lot's the same configuration that was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission and the UDC Commission that was approved uh, two years ago. That's right. So, so that configuration has not changed. It, the reason I'm asking is that it gets into this idea of the buffer. And, um, you know, while having a, a playground full of happy children seems like a, a good neighbor. Um, you know, service vehicles and garbage trucks and um, food delivery vehicles and a, a string of parents at, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning with their headlights shining in your window maybe isn't as good of a neighbor. And, you know, there is a change of use. There used to be a hockey rink there. Now there's more. There's a, a bigger parking lot and a different traffic pattern than maybe was the case before. So, um, you know, I'm inclined to think that, that these buffers might be a good idea when there's a specific... Um, you know, physical thing going on or a change to an existing use that might create a, uh, a, a different impact to the neighbors. Um, so I'll just, I'll throw that out. And, and I would tend to agree with you on that side of the property, that, that there is an expanded parking lot and the hockey rink is moving. Um, however, I, I know that we have bought plans before the municipality and not all school plans that go through the building department building permit system have to be upgraded all at one point when work is being done that doesn't affect another portion of the site. There's been some very site-specific decisions made by the commission that allow um, the sites not to be all upgraded at one point. And that's why we think that the commission can make a decision tonight that, that says the, the site that we're affecting does need to have that 15-foot buffer. The other portions of the site that are not changing as a result of the the building footprint effort um, aren't required for review. And I'm sure Sharon could come up. We, Central Middle School is a really good example. Central Middle School went in with over $1 million worth of improvements. And that site is woefully poor in terms of parking landscaping. Um, and it was not required to come before the Urban Design Commission. It was not required to have one single tree added with over. And I'm tempted to say that was a $3 million upgrade project on that school. Do you remember, Sharon? So, so there is, pre I guess I'm saying there is precedence to, to not have that additional buffer landscaping put in at this time. Yeah, and I would think that, you know, you, you've had, you mentioned that this school has been here for 40 years. That presumably predates the, the landscape buffer requirement. It's still the same use. It's still the same school. You may have changed X percent of the footprint or something like that, and you would have a case for changing X percent of the perimeter landscaping as, as part of a phased approach. But I think, you know, to, to take Sharon's lead, those aren't really things that we have purview over. Those might be arguments that you make to staff or to people who are, you know, or to Zeba or whoever you would have to petition for this kind of exception. Commissioner Briggs? Um, addressing what was just stated, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my experience with um, some commercial renovation projects has been that the amount of grandfathering required for site or in general in order to bring it up to current code is relative to something like extent of um, area being upgraded or project cost where X percentage of it goes towards grandfather requirements. So is that also true for a project like this where it is essentially a, a site renovation in a site renovation? City Chair, Mr. Briggs, yes, you're correct that um, any project, wh whether it be commercial or non-commercial, is, you know, the code applies to them. And if they are renovating the building, renovating the sites, they need to at that time bring the project up to meet code requirements. Is there not some threshold, though, where it's considered to be too much of an adverse requirement to grant, get them to grandfather, to bring the whole thing up to, to, to current code? I discussed this with um, Deb Agler this afternoon, and she was in agreement that um, it would have to be met, it would have to be brought up to meet current code. Given the extent of the, the project, there 
you know, um, of the renovation that they're doing is, is on there, site. Is, is there a quantitative threshold? I don't think there is a quantitative. If you do, if you could add one more parking space into a parking lot, make any change at all to the site, you then have to bring it up to meet current code requirements. Well, that's an interesting interpretation, but I think that we are getting down into interpretation issues. Um, I, I would think that the existing building code would have some language on it that would talk about what your responsibilities are based on how much you've altered the existing condition. You haven't altered the existing use. You've left a lot of the existing footprint of the building and a lot of the existing footprint of the site intact. I think there might be a, a vehicle for some relief there. but. It's not, uh, again, it's not within the authority of this board to make that, that ruling. Any other questions for petitioners? Do I have a motion? Commissioner Briggs. Move to approve UDC case number 204072 um, as meeting final landscape plan requirements with staff recommendations um, one through five, excluding staff recommendation six and staff recommendation seven. With staff request of changes to recommend or number two. <coughs> okay, we've got that on record. Uh, the motion has been seconded. Can you speak to the motion? Thank you. Um, <laughs> as Jane said, we are um, held to, uh, to what we are, we are um, empowered to do. Um, and while I personally completely agree with some of the arguments been present, presented to us um, for the treatment of the site, especially with the way it connects with the neighborhood, um, unfortunately that's uh, not our interpretation at the moment. Um, and I guess I would speak to the new Title 21 is hopefully having the opportunity for areas like this to uh, have an alternative compliance or some flexibility within that it is the, the possibility for um, another solution for items like this because I do agree with what the um, the um, people in front of us have said. So uh, thank you very much and uh, I, I'm personally sorry that uh, we can't be more flexible. <laughs> Any other discussion? And, and I would just offer that we're, this is kind of a slippery slope for us. We're dealing with a couple of other schools that have this same issue, and we're just trying to work out our consistency in how we administer this. And for now, I think we're just going to look at the code and, and be guided by that until that's changed. Any other discussion? Any objection to that motion passing? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Next case from the consent agenda, 2008-058, the final landscape review for 9th Avenue reconstruction from L to Latouche. <clears throat> and I'm trying to recall who pulled that case. Commissioner Joyner? Do you have specific questions for the petitioner? I do. I don't know if uh, Ms. Ferguson said there's some updates to this plan. I don't know if she wants to address those first. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, are, are we asking questions to someone? Is there anyone here on the... Is there a representative from the petitioner? Good evening, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Urban Design Commission. My name is Terry Schoenthal. Uh, with Land Design North, I represent uh, uh, this, this evening uh, the municipality and, on, uh, and am able to answer questions on their behalf. Also with me is Steve Carey from USKH, the project engineer. 
So if there are questions specifically dealing with some of the engineering aspects, he is able to address those. But um, are there any specific questions? I have a specific plant question. Um, on the uh, sand cherry, there's quite a few of those shrubs in here, and my experience has been they're not hardy. And actually, I was at the state nursery and greenhouse conference today, and I asked about four other people who have experience with that, and they all said, no, they're, no one's had, um, had those be reliable or especially anything above the snow level. And it, there's such a lot of them in here, and this is such an important project. I wondered if you have experience or maybe you could reconsider that with some other nine bark or some other red leaf uh, shrub that would be successful so you don't have, I think it's close to 100 that you might be replacing, especially a winter like this. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm in agreement on this. There's been a considerable amount of pressure, I would say, lately to increase uh, the diversity of plant materials we use. And, and I, it's a concern of mine because the uh, uh, it seems to crop up about once every 10 years or so, but um, we're certainly willing to consider this. We, there's been a little bit of pressure from Parks Department and from others who've reviewed this project to try to incorporate plants that, that perhaps are a little more experimental in nature. And what we've tried to do is when we did that, to group them with other plantings that we know are hardy. And so in the event that they go away, there aren't, it isn't a case of missing teeth in most cases. And I can't vouch that that's the case with the sand cherry in this particular one, but um, I think that's a very valid point and one we're certainly willing to reconsider. Um, I, I would suggest, uh, and I really appreciate that, that's brought forward from the Urban Design Commission, but Please also understand that there's, we're getting quite a bit of pressure from other uh, organizations to try to increase the diversity of the plant material on this particular project. Right, and, and I'm one of the people that's always for diversity. I know I would diversify the trees further, at least different species and cultivars, because you can lose so many, you know, given one pest, and we have experience with that here and around the country for hundreds of years. Um, but we have to diversify with something that we have reason to believe will be successful. And I think there's pretty clear consensus on that. In fact, Alaska, the landscape plants guide that um, Quality Extension does, which is our you know, main document we use for what do you, it says, not hardy in South Central. I mean, I, I think that one's a pretty clear where uh, I bark is it kind of a new one. People are using the purple leaf, and that seems to do fine. So I just need mm -hmm. to see us lose a whole lot of uh, something in such high-impact areas. So if, if there are others that you have concerns about, I'd, I'd welcome you bringing them forward. But we certainly will reconsider that and, and look for a hardier substitute. Oh, just that, and I don't know about the juniper either, because juniper has hard time in a lot of sites. But, but those are the only two species that... Um, seem likely to fail. Right. One of the, we, we've had some better fortune with juniper lately, and for whatever reason, if they're incorporated into any kind of stone or anything else, they seem to thrive pretty well. But if they're on their own, where they're just windswept and everything, they're, they're, in a lot, they're a lot more vulnerable. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the petitioner? Sharon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a couple of things I wanted to mention. One is uh, regarding condition number two. Uh, the park plan, it showed some major entries at the intersections with K, H, F, and D streets, and then a more minor entry at B street, and then I um, checked those with, you know, against the 9th Avenue plan, and there weren't crosswalks at these sort of major park entries. And so I asked them to take another look at that. And the design consultants met with the traffic engineer to see if it was possible to put crosswalks in these locations. And the traffic engineer was not in favor of providing these in, the, in, in those locations. But they are going to provide curb cuts along those four streets on the south side of the, uh, of the street. 
so that anyone in a wheelchair uh, would be able to cross the streets in those locations. So I just wanted to mention that. And the other thing, there's a meeting earlier this week discussing the park, and there are plans to put irrigation um, on the south side of the area within the park boundaries. And also, they'll probably also extend the irrigation under the road out to um, any of the planted medians within the park area. That's all I have. Commissioner Briggs. So for clarification, um, is staff recommendation number two kind of made unnecessary? Uh, let me just done? read that real quickly here. Yes, we can delete that one. And then, Mr. Schoenthal, do you object to um, the only re or the remaining recommendations at all? The other staff recommendations? No, we have no issues with the remaining recommendations. And I had a question I earlier addressed to, to Jeff when we were talking about the master plan for the park trip, but it's not clear to me from the design information why the sidewalk doesn't go inboard uh, towards the park on the block between A and C Street. Um, the, the sidewalk is pushed out to the curb um, with the people par parking directly or walking next to the, to the traffic lane. And I was just curious as to, you know, what kind of geological features or whatnot were preventing you from delivering the same type of design along that part of the park as the others. Um, it's a good question. The, the issue is grading. If uh, it, wherever the sidewalk is immediately adjacent to the top back of curb, it's been done that way as a result of sloping away from the, the back of curb if in fact the sidewalk stayed removed from that, uh, it probably runs into dealing with uh, retaining walls or some other means. Whereas uh, in that particular location, it's possible to uh, pull the sidewalk out and then deal with the grade changes just through landscape, uh, addressing it through landscape. It, 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 I, I'm just trying to get my mind around why it would be important to create this park-like setting with a protected pedestrian way for the rest of the park strip and whatever investment that that requires with plaza paving and everything else um, as opposed to you know going ahead and doing some retaining wall work or reconfiguring the ball fields or doing something to to deliver on what your narrative says is one of your main objections or main objectives for the design um, the, I mean, we've gone through it, a considerable amount of review on, on that, and, and it's just the way that it's gone at this point. Uh, it, it does uh, probably disrupt the continuity to some degree in there, in that particular area. But at this point in time, the, the desire was to, to simply move that sidewalk up to uh, the curb at that location. And, and from an engineering perspective, I think Perhaps I'd invite Steve to, to speak to that briefly, but uh, sure. it, it just seems to be, you know, I can understand it, you know, from Cordova down where you have a different kind of condition, but at the park itself, when you've stated that one of your objectives is to do this, and on every other park, on every other block where you have the park, you've been able to accomplish it. I, I just wasn't given an explanation as to what the particular challenges were on this block that kept you from sort of delivering on that. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that Terry didn't mention is that as we transition back in from a three-lane to a four-lane roadway, you know, in between the areas of E Street to A Street roughly, you know, we've got, you know, four lanes of traffic to maintain, so we, we don't have the luxury of, of some buffer area that we had, you know, further to the west. Um, but, uh, but I think probably the biggest thing is, is the grade, the way that it drops off fairly significantly as you head east and approaching A Street and, uh, you know, for to maintain some separation and, and have a, uh, you know, a, a, a pathway or sidewalk that's about the same elevation, we are going to end up with a quite a sizable retaining wall, which is a possibility. I, I uh, But I don't know whether, you know, given the use there with the softball field, whether that would have a, the effect of uh, really 
cutting into the space that they have to play today. Um, but those were the reasons, I think, that were kind of drove why we had it at the back. I mean, just a casual look at it, you know, you've got the buffer, the, the trees there already, and you've got the sidewalk there already, and if you swap them, if even if you needed a few more feet so that you could do a grade change, maybe drop the elevation of the sidewalk, it just seems like getting people in the park away from that traffic lane, especially since you have more intense traffic with your four lanes of traffic as opposed to the three lanes that you have elsewhere, that that, that would have been a consideration. Um, and it, it, I don't know, it just stuck out to me as being odd given the context of, of how you've developed that design. Mm -hmm. Could we uh, bring forward uh, the head of Parks and Recreation perhaps to speak to this issue? Yeah, I, I apologize when you asked the question earlier. The, the third factor was we, we required a minimum of a 12-foot setback from the curb to a sidewalk if we were going to have a planning medium. So we didn't want a minimal area. So if you have a 12 foot and then you bring the sidewalk in, what that does is it will get into the, the range of the softball field. One of the challenges we have at Delaney, right now it has six softball fields. The outfields are 225 feet. Today we're building them at 275 feet. We just got stronger players. And so that it was just a compromise at that one block because the outfield that's the only place where the outfield was hitting towards um, 9th Avenue. So it was just just one of those, as we worked, tried every element, uh, if we bring it in and then the 12 feet, put the walkway and then a wall, you do cut into the, the outfield for the, the fast pitch. But are you trying to preserve the ball field in its existing location? Because it looked like there was quite a bit of distance from the home plate or whatever to whatever the next would be, 10th Avenue, I guess. Uh, well, it, on, the, it's on, a right the, field. on the drawings that you provided, yeah. it looked like there was room to shift the field down if you needed to. Those two fields we are trying to preserve in their existing locations. Okay, well, I guess I'm clear on your intent. Any other questions? Commissioner Joyner. Just on that, I'm, I'm thinking how that looks, because I played Salva there. The trees, the trees will be lower than the sidewalk there, won't they? Yes, they will. So, I mean, I can see why you can't switch because that you could put the trees lower, but you couldn't put the sidewalk because it is quite a drop off there. That's correct. Yeah, you'd have it'd be a big retaining wall, and then that would interfere with trees growing there. I would think. Well, I, I, the sidewalk would be if you did that. The sidewalk would be adjacent to the retaining wall. The trees would be on the street side. They'd get switched around, but then you end up with a retaining wall at the outside edge of that softball field, which is not a particularly desirable situation either. So, and I have seen people clear that fence with softballs. You just need to drop the field down even further. Okay. Any other questions for the petitioner? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Joyner. I move for approval of case 2008-958, final approval for 9th Avenue reconstruction, L Street to Latouche Street. With um, staff recommendations one and three. I guess three will be two now. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Briggs. Would you like to discuss your motion? Um, well, this, this is a really important project, I think, to the community. It's going to make a real big difference downtown, and it's long overdue. And I think they've done a good job of meeting the requirements and improving the pedestrian environment and um, activities in the park and uh, changing the traffic where it's safer and uh, improving the um, plant palette and I think it's going to be something that really makes a difference in the downtown area for people that live and work there. Anyone else? Just comment on the motion? Any objections? 
to the motion? Seeing none, it passes. We move to the regular agenda, and uh, I've been informed that, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, case 2009-008 for the Walmart store in East Anchorage, um, the petitioner has requested a, uh, a delay or a postponement, and I guess that's not a unilateral decision, so I'll entertain a motion uh, from the commission to, um, to postpone that case. Yeah, and I guess the direction is to postpone for next, the next meeting. Um, so moved by Commissioner Briggs and seconded. Any objection? Seeing none, that will be postponed to the next meeting. So on to the regular agenda, case 2009-010, um, AWWU. Water Reservoir. Do we have a staff report? Yes. The Department of Project Management and Engineering is requesting a final landscape review approval uh, for the Golden View Reservoir project. This is the first time that you have reviewed this project. Also, it will be the only time that you will review it. The 2005 Anchorage Water uh, Master Plan identified the need for a 2 million gallon water tank to serve the Rabbit Creek Road area. The proposed water tank makes use of, um, this project makes use of the existing site where there's a half million gallon uh, water tank already located there. Um, the site is 2.4, uh, approximately 2.4 acres. Uh, it's located uh, near the, the end of uh, Lena Point Circle at the southeast corner of Prominence Point subdivision. The site has a 13 had a 13% slope prior to the construction of a half uh, million gallon water tank. The current site is uh, uh, flat uh, and it's been recessed into the mountainside. Also there is a berm on the outward uh, facing side of the, the site. Um, plants have to be uh, hardy and withstand zone two in this area where uh, there's minus uh, 60 degree uh, uh, temperatures and extreme winds. The project team has stated that AWU will be responsible for uh, landscape maintenance after the warranty period, typically one year, has expired. The method of irrigation will be by water truck. Um, this will be a low priority watering area too. Um, existing trees around the water tank will be retained where, wherever possible. The future residential lots above the site uh, are not yet developed. Those future homes will have a partially obscured view of the existing tank and the new tank. The new tank will make use of the existing development uh, pad uh, and access road. And again, the site is uh, recessed into the mountain. The uh, new white spruce trees and Sitka alder shrubs will blend into the existing hillside vegetation. The primary purpose of the landscaping is to screen the tank uh, from houses below the site. The site is not meant for public access. The proposed plantings will require little maintenance. Uh, therefore, the department recommends approval of the final public facility landscaping uh, for this Golden View Reservoir project, subject to uh, conditions one through four on page three of the packet. Um, these are all uh, standard conditions. There's nothing uh, um, noteworthy in them. Uh, thank you. Any commissioners have questions for staff? Commissioner Briggs. Um, condition number four, I'm assuming that just means that this is, they have to be in compliance with their own packet. Um, I don't know if I've seen this recommendation before as a standard one. Uh, through the chair, yeah. Um, let's see, for... It almost seems redundant. Well, in, in many of the cases that I've written, um, I've required the, uh, uh, the, um, the final project to uh, be in compliance with um, what they've written and the, the plans that they've submitted. 
Um, I, I guess I don't. Um, it's, a, it's a standard condition on some cases that it's been a while since I've been back to the UDC. I'm not sure. I, I guess my question is whether, it, whether it's needed or not, or it's just assumed that um, by our approving this project that it needs to be with, within what the submittal is. Um, I, I think that um, um, you can assume that the ap application, um, uh, that, that what they've submitted is what they uh, need to be in compliance with in order to get their development permits. Um, however, um, I think that the, the condition is warranted, um, even if it's uh, redundant. Other questions for staff? Mr. Kampler? Yes. Um, what color is this reservoir going to be? Um, I would uh, defer to the uh, uh, the project uh, uh, the project team to answer that question. I believe they've decided on uh, gray, which is the same color of the, as the uh, existing um, tower. And the reason for that is that it they want it to be as uh, 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 as, go as unnoticed as possible, and they have to deal with both uh, winter, where it's white, and summer, where it may be uh, green and brown. Um, but uh, that's a worthwhile question for the for the petitioner. Uh, was there any public comment regarding concern about uh, visual impacts of uh, a reservoir, this new reservoir that's larger than the current one? Uh, it's an excellent question. I have to defer to the uh, the uh, uh, applicant. Okay. Oh, um, there's a short discussion of the. Yeah, there's a sh short discussion of the public, uh, but it's 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 fairly. Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, a general. Uh, it's a good question to ask the the project team. Any other questions for staff? Okay, is the petitioner here? I invite them to come forward. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Bruce Schrobson uh, with the firm of NWH, and I'm representing the Anchorage Water Wastewater Utility as their uh, project manager for this project and can speak on their behalf. Um, to the commission also, along with me this evening, is uh, Lise Huggins with Earthscape. She's a landscape designer on the project. And also we have Donna Lee with r &M Consultants, who uh, is the designer on the project. Uh, I know you have quite a bit of information already in front of you relevant to this project that's been provided in the packets, but I'd like to provide a, a little larger overview. The uh, project actually goes back to the 90s. Uh, where the need for additional water storage was identified as a probability way back in the 94 water master plan. That was further reinforced in the more recent plan in 2005. Uh, when development occurred in the Golden View area, i.e. the uh, Golden View subdivision, Providence Point, the Golden View Middle School at that point in time, uh, the project uh, was a was a Cooperative, cooperative project between the school district and a private developer. They identified the need to store water for, for uh, emergency demand and particularly for fire water supply. And their needs at that point in time were identified as a half million gallon. However, the utility said, well, we can see we have a bigger need, so we'd like to see a site in there that could support up to two million gallons. And therefore, back in 96, there was a approval through the conditional use of the conceptual for the two million gallon capacity in that site that we're talking about. Um, as the time went on and uh, developments occurred through there, the utility, as you said, has already reinforced the need for additional storage and therefore pursued that expanded storage uh, uh, in excess of two years ago. So we've been actually going through a public process for over two years now. Uh, we spent all that two years, probably a year and a half, of, of focus public and process, which not only included this reservoir here, but another location for another reservoir in the South Anchorage area as well, some water transmission mains. And so we actually identified about almost 15 sites of potential use in this area, narrowed it down to four, and as it discusses in the application, came up with two sites that were finalist. Um, those sites actually were helped to be identified uh, and prioritized 
through a uh, group that we organized through a public process of a uh, advisory group that was composed of members from community councils in the area, uh, HALO, uh, the Hillside District Plan uh, Advisory Group, and others, so that we we had them involved to look at what are the alternatives, what are the rankings, etc. So, so we pursued it in that fashion, and that finally identified that uh, there were two sites that met the criteria. However, through the uh, aspect of of water demand, both uh, in the future and currently, and as everybody's seen, some of the development has dropped off. The utility has a need for a million gallons immediately, and therefore decided let's pursue a million gallon reservoir addition in the SAMS uh, location as we call it, and that stands for the South Anchorage Middle School site uh, up here at Prominence Point. And therefore, the configuration you see is a design layout for what we plan to, to start construction on hopefully later this year. Um, as you look at the uh, drawings that were provided to you, the configuration is basically an expansion of the existing site. All the work that will be accomplished will be within the existing lot footprint. Uh, the elevation of the proposed tank will be the same elevation as the existing tank. The berms basically being moved out and will continue on around. Um, I'd like to, uh, here in a moment, take a, let Elise speak to the landscaping issues or items. Uh, the location of the new tank, the proposed tank, is really predicated upon an offset distance minimum requirement of 40 feet that was specified in the application. This has been identified as a minimum when we'd like to put two tanks near each other for maintenance needs and expansion requirements, etc. So, uh, But aside from that, uh, I don't know if Elise, you have anything to say on the landscape? Commission, um, Elise Higgins. The, the only thing I'd add is the landscape design here is based on the previous landscape design when the previous um, water reservoir went in. We pretty much took that concept and, and and went with it that had been approved by the public as well as various commissions. So that, that was, um, we did change some plants to more native plants. Um, we got rid of lilac on the hillside, but um, other than that, it's a pretty basic landscape plan, we think. I think things are pretty straightforward. Maybe we'll just have, uh, if there's any questions for the petitioners. Uh, Commission, I think there's two questions hanging out there. One was relevant to the color of the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, the tank's a fairly light color, tannish color. Uh, the key thing about this tank, different than many of the other tanks in, in the Anchorage area, as well as the new one, is it needs to be insulated, and therefore uh, we're going to work with trying to come up with a fairly passive color that doesn't stand out too much. So as I said, currently it's a, it's, it's a fairly tannish uh, sandstone kind of color. So, And then I can't remember to call what the other question was hanging out there. Okay. And I, I think I covered the public process uh, that we went through on that. So, I'd ask that you use the uh, sign-up provision. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, do you have a question? I threw the chair. I just... Um, I uh, wanted to uh, add one more uh, note to my comments, which was that uh, uh, this project will have to apply for uh, a major amendment to a conditional use permit, um, and that will act as their uh, site plan uh, review for the, uh, in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. And they just recently submitted that, very recently submitted that uh, application for a major amendment to a conditional use permit to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you. Commissioner Joyner. I have a question for Ms. Huggins. Uh, you had a couple options for the staking one that it be removed after a year, which I think is part of mass and certainly should be done. The other was that subgrade uh, staking. Um, are you still thinking of the subgrade? Or? We, are, we really haven't talked to the utility about that issue. That would be a new design for them. Um, um, th right now, that's our preference because we're never sure about people getting back up to the sites to remove stakes. Um, well, I, I just wanted to recommend not using the subgrade okay. from what I looked at it. I, it seems like a poor idea in the way you, you, you would have to plant it in a way that's not recommended that you don't usually do either with keep the fabric on. Um, but perhaps if they, the 
contract's not approved until, or it's not closed out until the staking comes off? Certainly if the commission has a preference, we can go either way with the staking. And I did have a question on the others. Have been there 10 years that are staked still? The plans, actually the specifications and the utility supports this. We will require the new contractor to go in and remove stakes and um, to the extent possible um, remove some of the girdling that's happened on trees. You're, you're correct though, in the interpretation that apparently the trees that were put in there did have still have stakes on them. We only discovered that during our site visit this past fall. Right, and the concern with that, I mean, I think the uh, the screening is really necessary at that facility and you're in a high wind, harsh site in 10 years. It seems those trees are really likely to not make it. I mean, that's a structural damage that I, I don't do know what it's like. They probably didn't grow very fast, but you might have an arborist, one of the city arborists, look at those to see if they if they should be left or if they're... None of the wires are intact on the ground. Okay. Um, it's really just wires that have been left around the trunks and are girdling the trunks. Um, not a single tree has been girdled, so it's just the wires wrapping and the tree has started to grow over the wires. There wasn't a single tree that didn't have cambium space op open on sides of it. So it's really, in our minds, a simple matter of clipping away the wire. You, you're right, there is some weakness there in the trunk with the high wind area. Um, and and we, can, we can ask the municipal arborists to come and, and inspect the trees as well. But, but we did look at them. For that. Without seeing them, it's hard to tell. I just know that's a, because you see them snap off so often yep. at that point. And, and they're the candidates for license. snapping. Okay. Okay, thanks. Hi, Commissioner Kemplin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So did, during the consideration of landscaping, did the um, uh, petitioner look at uh, doing uh, something with the, you know, the, the uh, vertical element of the tank itself? Could you repeat the question? I'm not quite sure I understand that. There is a, uh, for context, uh, mm -hmm. on a lower hillside, there's another very large, um, you know, structure, enclosed uh, structure um, that, um, uh, has uh, you know green sort of a, a trees uh, you know, painted uh, you know, around it as part of a, a landscaping approach to soften the impact visual impact of a large expansive uh, space you know, <laughs> visual uh, image and that so as I was looking at you know this particular large um, facility. That's going to be, you know, if it looks to be fairly uniform, uh, that one approach to landscaping would be to um, treat the uh, this, uh, metal itself, the tank itself, uh, as a canvas for um, uh, doing trees, painting trees, uh, you know, on it uh, to lessen the impact, especially given, you know, the significant high wind area and the challenges that uh, survivability of the landscape you know, will have up there? Uh, let me speak there first and if at least once add something. Uh, we had a, we can, we've already been considering that relevant to this location. However, uh, the one you're also talking about currently is when there's service high reservoir. Uh, we've all, the utility's also done similar in Eagle River uh, to a reservoirs up there. And they also will entertain and probably do some around some other large facilities like those reservoirs throughout the community. However, this tank location is rather unique in the fact that it needs to be insulated. Most all the other tanks throughout Anchorage are not insulated tanks. And through the insulation process, they require an exterior surfacing, generally a metal, some form of a metal restraining structure around the tank, which is pre-fabricated pre pre, uh, coatings on it. It's very difficult to, to paint so something of that type on it at this point that it's, it's going to sustain some uh, life expectancy. So we did discuss it, and at this point in time, had chosen not to. Uh, we did it'd be a little bit of a challenge to figure out how to do it and make it uh, survive. But I feel anything to add to that, Elise? It, it doesn't need to be painted. There's no views of it. 
Um, all the views, um, when you go up above the tank, the existing tank, this is a really nice one because you have an existing tank so you can kind of imagine a new tank. Um, there are no views, no one would see the trees painted on the tank. So when people are, um, you know, looking at this, that there's uh, no... It's a private road. It's a, it's a private road up to the tank. It's a narrow maintenance only, maintenance vehicle only road up to the tank. Most of the views are below the tank. And, and the, the, the thing that we've done is we've created these berms so the tank is set into the berms. So, so instead of painting the trees, we're, you can look at it, we're planting the trees. So, uh, so this is not visible from like flat top then? If you look at the visual analysis, you can kind of see where it's visible from. And the most, the closest, most visible point reservoir roof um, and it actually tends to disappear in the summer because of the vegetative cover um, in the winter it tends because of uh, Francis is right because of the color of it it tends to disappear with the snow on the ground um, we did discuss changing the color it can't be blue because then it would look like a blob of sky in the middle of the ground um, there just didn't seem to be and the bottom line is, is when we talked to the public and we all looked at it we said you know it's it's fine it's fine. It looks like a patch of snow. But okay. Well, well, thank you very much. It's, it's nice to hear that the petitioner has given it serious consideration. Anyone else have questions for the petitioners? I do have a quick one. Uh, is there any seeding associated with the project, or is it any erosion? Possibilities. There are almost erosion possibilities. There will be the slopes will be seeded, and we'll probably use a tackifier um, to adhere the seed. Um, it's actually quite interesting now. If there's any opportunities for plant people, um, there are one-to-one -one slopes up there now that are heavily vegetated in two to four inches thick of moss. Mm. It's really kind of wonderful. Thanks. So, any other questions? All right. Well, it's time for a motion. Commissioner Kimmer. Uh, move to approve case 2009-010 as uh, meeting requirements for final landscape review of the Urban Design Commission uh, to include Planning Department recommendations one through four. And I see that's been seconded. Any discussion? Uh, no, very straightforward project. Uh, and I don't think it bears any further discussion. Thanks. Anyone opposed to passing the motion? Excuse me, Commissioner Joyner. I wanted to propose a con condition um, that the standard staking method per mass be used and not the underground, the subgrade staking of the trees. Is that acceptable? I would accept that as an amendment. Yes. Peter? That amendment's acceptable to you too? Yes. Okay, thanks. My, my only question on that would be, um, I guess typically what we just normally do is to ask some, or make a recommendation. Um, but you want to. No, make it a can statement. be a recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So with that amendment, um, are there any objections to the motion passing? Seeing none, that also passes unanimously. And I, I guess I should state, I've been informed that, uh, that the regular agenda is not really a public meeting. So um, 
we don't necessarily have to have a presentation from the petitioner. Is that correct? We can kind of take this in any form we want. And I just say that because the next case is another AWWU uh, sort of small scope utility booster substation. And uh, we might be able to get through this one a little quicker if it is straightforward. Um, staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the proposal extends public sewer and water facilities in the Sand Lake area. The site is located in the northwest corner of the Anchorage Sand and Gravel Pit. The site was cleared of vegetation some time ago. The proposed landscaping uses a mix of birch and spruce, which will begin to restore a palette of native vegetation. The spruce trees will be of varying height at either six feet or eight feet. The differing heights will help lend a natural appearance to the development. The middle states, um, the driveway will be framed with landscaping and as a driveway will blend into the pattern of driveways that exist along Sand Lake Road. Yet she, L5, doesn't show any landscaping along the driveway. The driveway should be landscaped accordingly. The neighboring residential development is heavily wooded, thus a dense planting of trees is appropriate to blend the booster station into the neighborhood. I would like to make a modification to condition number three. And I want to insert a phrase into that condition. So it will read, provide landscaping along the driveway to the edge of the right of way to blend the booster station into the existing neighborhood. And um, staff just realized that the plan shows white spruce. And it's typical when we see white spruce. Um, <laughs> included in the plant schedule to include a condition that the white spruce shall be nursery grown. So I would like to add uh, condition number five that says white spruce shall be nursery grown. Anything else? Any questions for staff? Commissioner Briggs. Just a quick um, a comment, uh, Sharon. In, in your opinion, um, oh, we're missing that. Normally one of the considerations is saying that uh, landscaping shall meet ANZ Z80.1. Uh, Z80 um, that's missing from this as a recommendation. <laughs> or and it may be already on the plans, so I didn't it, include it. It's it. probably on the plans. <laughs> yeah, it's on the plans. Note um, number one. For, for stating that white spruce shall be nursery grown, the intent of that is getting a full ratio, nice fluffy white spruce tree for good installation. Right. Is that not covered within ANSI Z80.1? I think all it is is the five to three. There's no mention of it beyond that. It's just based, typically we've had poor success with using white spruce that they've dug up somewhere. And I'm not saying they're going to do that, but this just prevents that from happening. And just to maintain consistency when we're, you know, we've reviewing plans that include the white spruce. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Is there a representative of the project here? Would you come forward? And maybe just for efficiency, I'll just start by asking if you have any objections to the department recommendations that have been put forth. No. Yes, I do. <laughs> Commissioners, this is Elise Huggins. Thanks for your patience with me. Um, condition number three is amended by um, Sharon. We actually feel right now that we meet that condition. The only reason we wouldn't meet it is because we have set some boulders um, adjacent to that entry drive. To that, to that edge. Um, 
which does, we did Google, um, Google Earth, and, and, and I can hand this around, but, but that does tend to follow the pattern of driveways, these long driveways, no landscaping until you get to the right-of-way line. Uh, but but I, I think our bigger concern is not wanting to plant outside of AWW property. So on condition three, we would just ask that you review what we've done and, and agree that it meets that standard. Um, condition four, delete Amy choke cherry. Um, that's really, that plant was on the plant schedule. This is, this booster station is part of a larger project. Uh, the only reason that plant shows up on the plant schedule is because we do have a, a neighbor that has a tree that might be impacted and that's simply replacing that existing tree with, with the same tree species. And we have no problem with the um, addition of condition um, five nursery grown white spruce. Now you can do it. Sharon, was it your intention for the planning to extend off of the property? No, not off the property, the just comment? down to the property line. Okay, and this is not, not into the right of way. Does this satisfy what you were looking for? I can't really see it from here. So are we good if we... Yeah, we're fine the way that Elise has shown that. So we could probably remove that condition altogether? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion. It's been moved. Commissioner Briggs? Move to approve UDC case 2009-009 as meeting UDC requirements for concept <coughs> landscape plan review with the inclusion of department recommendations 1, 2, and 4 with the deletion of number 3 and the addition of condition 5, white spruce shall be nursery grown. That's been seconded by Commissioner Nia. Any discussion? Sound like we could delete four because there is an amur cherry possibly. You want to make that as a friendly amendment? Certainly. Thank you. With the deletion of uh, recommendation number four. Right. That's okay with you, Juan. All right. Now discussion. Thank you. Okay. Any objection to passing the motion? Seeing, hearing none, motion passes. Next case, 2009-015 for the sound barrier fence on Northern Lights. Do we have a staff report on that? Yes, this is uh, here for both concept site and landscape <laughs> and concept uh, landscape plan review. This is the second phase of the sound barrier project along Northern Lights Boulevard. The Urban Design Commission heard the first phase of this project on in July of 2006. The project begins where the first phase ended at Glenwood Street and, ru and runs west to the New Seward Highway. There's also a remaining section that will be covered in the second phase that spans the length of the condominiums from Maplewood, Maplewood Street east to the end of the condominium development. The wall will, will be exposed in its entirety between Latouche Street and the New Seward Highway. The absence of available right-of-way pre precludes the use of trees to soften the view of the wall. However, shrubs are employed for much of the extent of the barrier. The design consultants continued an element of a recently completed road improvement project on Latouche, on Latouche Street in the Rogers Park neighborhood. That project included a gateway feature and trellises. The sound barrier project uses the trellis feature to integrate the wall into the neighborhood and mask the sterility of the wall. Also, I've been in um, conversation with the project engineer, Rebecca Campbell, who's here tonight, 
and I believe that they, they will, um, are going to extend the, the wall to the edge of the church property at uh, about station 30. And also they're going to overlap the wall where it's needed um, at station 32. I think they're going to do a 10-foot um, overlap for that, extend each wall by 10 feet. And um, Rebecca Campbell could speak to, um, there were some comments in, in your packet about the snow storage in relationship to the wall, and I think she can update the commission on what is planned for that. I'll answer any questions the commission may have. Questions for staff? Nope. Is there a representative of the project? You guys have seen Elise quite a bit, so I think you know who she is. <laughs> I'm uh, Rebecca Campbell. I'm with CRW. I'm representing the municipality. And of course, Elise is our uh, the landscape architect. As Sharon said, this is the second phase of the project. The first phase was uh, we determined how loud the sound was back there, how big of an issue. Um, with the community council support, we selected uh, what type of wall they wanted, which we had settled on a wood wall that would blend in with the trees in most of the area. Uh, with that, we uh, went and for the most part, we tried to uh, hide the wall behind the existing vegetation so it wouldn't be seen. And then with it being wood, it would uh, blend in with the trees where we couldn't, which is what Sharon said is between, uh, right in front of Fred Meyer, between Latouche and uh, the Seward Highway, we have uh, added landscaping and also the trellis structure to incorporate into the um, what was done previously. Uh, through this whole process, we've had the uh, support of the community council, and I just wanted to point out a couple of them are here tonight to show their support for the project. Uh, this has been completely com community driven. So uh, we have, we've met with them as soon as last week, as recent as last week, and they are in support of the project. They did have one request that I didn't include with Sharon. Uh, they would like to do some additional clearing between the pathway and uh, the condominiums where the fence is. They think it's gonna be a security issue with the fence right there where we clear about a five to six foot space between the fence and uh, there'll be a, a nice little cleared area for a little while and they're worried that people will congregate behind there. They want just to clear the alder so it won't be quite so uh, brushy. They want to leave the, the, the larger trees and so it'll be a little bit more visual if they're on the pathway. As uh, last week as well, I met with uh, street maintenance. Uh, they were concerned that we only showed uh, three foot for snow storage. I told them that that wasn't technical, technically correct. We're actually showing more than that, closer to five feet, which is what they recommended. But as part of this project, we want to make sure that we minimize clearing. So we pick up the fence where we have to. You know, if there's a tree in the way, we want to leave some flexibility for the contractor to move the fence post so he can save a tree. But the only thing that is uh, the absolute requirement is we have to keep three feet there between the pathway and the wall for uh, uh, safety issues with bicyclists. So once I straighten that out with uh, street maintenance, they were okay with that. And in almost all spots, we're going to meet the uh, requirements. And the only place we want is if during construction we had an issue and we wanted to save a tree. And the only option was to go in front of the tree and not behind it. But uh, other than that, um, I think that's it. Do you want to say something, Elise? Commissioners, thank you again for listening to me. Um, just in review of the department, I, I, one I'd like to give, this design is a continuation from the design that was approved before. The only addition is um, we have heard the um, real successful design that was done for the gateways for the community, for that neighborhood. So this design actually um, respectfully steals that element and tries to repeat it and, and enhance that element. Um, so just like to say that that's what we've, we've tried to do here is, is, is repeat and enhance something that, that's apparently working quite well. And I, in terms of um, the conditions, um, condition one we were okay with, condition two we were fine. Um, condition three, ex consider extending the wall west uh, to the end of the church parking lot to approximately station 29 plus zero zero. The wall has been extended a little bit, um, but community concern is bringing it, in, it back just a little bit. So, so we'd really like that condition either to be removed or, or to say something to, to resolve that issue with the community in, in terms of the location of the fence. Um, 
provide an overlap, appropriate overlap at the wall sections. I believe that's been resolved and we're fine with that. And then condition number five, of course, we will do that. Thank you. Sharon? Yes. Can you explain a little bit more about condition three and the situation with that? I didn't quite understand. I believe the intent of this is to provide not only protection for the first row of houses right here, but also the back row as well. And to extend it all the way, I believe the church parking lot ends over here. To extend it all the way over there, it's really not adding much more. Because most of the traffic noise that's coming back over here is coming from Latouche. The cars are going this way on, I think it's Benson, or Northern Lights that goes this way. But they're also coming in right here from the other one, Benson or Northern Lights. So the way it's coming in right here is we're going to block it by doing this. And I don't really see the need to spend uh, the extra money. Just to, It's not going to give you much benefit to go further. And that was the only concern that the community council had. But the cars going down Northern Lights? They're going this way. Right. Most of it's from the tailpipes. So you should be, I mean, most of the benefit you're going to get is going to be done through that. I mean, there's not much we can do for the second row of houses without building a fence across the church park, the church front too. But is it the same situation with all the houses? Isn't it the same situation where it's all the, the noise from the cars passing just behind their houses? I mean, isn't that the same same thing that the noise is coming out of the tailpipes as they're? So I don't understand the argument. I mean, you're putting the wall because. Right. The noise of northern lights for all those right. houses. But most of the, I mean, the, the houses that are really going to be benefited, the second row are going to be from here east. These two that are on the end, they will receive some benefit, but they're not going to receive any from this direction because we can't extend the wall far enough. Far enough. We can't. I mean, and the benefit's going to be coming from this angle, like a 45 degree angle. So, I mean, if we, the, the way the wall is extended to this point, if you extend it 45 degrees, it cuts, it mm -hmm. cuts that, uh, that second lot. But, I mean, we still can't do anything about Latouche and that intersection without uh, extending the wall in front of the church, which I don't, I don't think would be acceptable to them. So it's not so much that the community objects to the wall. You just don't see that it, there's going to be a benefit by it. I don't see a benefit, and they, um, yeah, they, they didn't really want to look at it if it wasn't going to benefit the homes. No questions? Could you clarify uh, the statement you made about uh, allowing a little additional clearing, I think is what you mentioned? The way we have it, the way we did the first phase is uh, we have the, the, the wall laid out. And they'll go survey it, they, they go out and they survey it. And if the wall runs right through the middle of a tree, uh, well I should say this, after they survey all the clearing limits that they need, we have uh, a lease and also a member from the community council and, uh, and myself and somebody from the municipality goes out there and we make a judgment call on if we can shift the clearing limits to missed trees. So when I say that we have five feet, but we're allowed to go down to three feet, it's because if while we're doing a walkthrough of the clearing limits, if we decide to shift the wall, we can go up to three feet, up to that three foot clearance. And does that relate to, I think you were mentioning something about uh, people maybe hiding back in an area? Oh, now that's where the Woodside East condominiums. They're concerned that uh, we'll have at least a six-foot cleared spot in front of the wall, and that's just for installation. It's what we're required. Um, well, we have to clear it out, and there's like a mass of alders right in front of it, um, so much so that there's an existing fence right now at Woodside East, and you can barely see it. So there'll be this open space where people can possibly get back in there, and they won't be able to see them from the pathway. So they were concerned. And um, this isn't coming just from the community council. It's coming from the condominium association as well. And it was a request if, that if we could do it, they would like it done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kasich. Uh, I, the trellis feature is a really great feature, and I was just curious as to why it ended where it ended and why it wasn't continued throughout. Okay. 
the location of it was really to reflect that where the community has it. The, when you have a gateway feature, you don't really want to repeat it a lot because then it's no longer a gateway feature. So, so it was kind of just related to that that block area. Well, I was just wondering, like, because it, it, it's right out the touche that the gateway feature is located, and it's on one side of the street but not the other side of the street. So it's kind of left there on one block and not continued on the other side. We could look at... at Yeah, yes, if that's a possibility, just to frame it more. Oh, yes, I almost forgot my question. Um, going back to the question of the alders, can you give us an idea of, of the extent of them in terms of the width and the length? Or? Um, I'd say it's probably about a 10 to 15 foot swath of alders. That runs the whole length of in front, in front of, the of the condominiums, yeah. About 10 to 15 feet. Yeah. Away. And they're what, 10 feet, 8 feet tall? Taller than me. I have a, yeah. They're taller than me, so they're about like that high. Okay. Commissioner Briggs. For the, um, the, uh, the, the trellis features on the, um, the sheet L4, um, I'm assuming this is vertically exaggerated. So the trellis features, they're numbered, that they're kind of in the 100 to 150 feet apart range, just to get a feeling of proportion. They, they are vertically exaggerated. Um, so the trellis features will match what's out there now. Um, we have um, changed the proportions slightly, but... but, but or, or more so as winning the repetition for them, so it looks like they're about 150 feet apart for the groupings. Along the, um, the center line or the, uh, the um, station points that are on the bottom of the sheet. So again, with the question there... I, I, I'm just curious, I just want to verify, so it seems like there's quite a number on this sheet, but it's probably a little bit misleading that they're about 150 feet apart. Yes, they are. Okay. And then out of curiosity, what was the, uh, you know, how did you sort of determine the number of ones that you are putting in here? Because I... Um, we expect that to change because we were, um, when we got in the field, we were trying to get a little better pattern and a rhythm to them. Right now they're a little bit more, um, but, but actually they're... Um, we, we expect field to, to go out and play with it in the field a little bit more. Because it seems like there, there are quite a number um, of them right now, but I like it. So your preference would be and I don't know where you stole this from, but good feeling. <laughs> we will give credit publicly to Kevin Donier. Who? What? Kevin. You guys didn't design that? No. Sharon? Yes, I'm sorry I didn't ask this earlier, but back to the alders again. Um, is the idea would you be grabbing those out or just cutting them off at ground? You don't want to grab them, right? Um, we would have to debate that, but our preference would be to just cut them off so we don't hurt trees or to maybe do a combination of cutting and grabbing. Um, you know, if we cut them off, we're going to encourage... Won't they just grow back? Exactly. Yeah. Um, however, if we grab them out and we have some good birch tree roots or other root systems in there, um, we risk damaging existing vegetation. So that, um, Rebecca and I can talk about that. That might be a little bit of this and that. Um, the goal would be to remove the plants completely without damaging existing vegetation. And then is there a thought to what's going to replace, go in that 10 to 15 foot space? Would you replant or just simply reseed or? At this time we would probably reseed, but I mean we just, uh, Got this from the, this in, input from the committee council on Thursday, so we really haven't put a lot of thought into it. 
it's something new that came up. So, I mean, it's, it's what they'd like to do, but it's not a, it's not a, a big deal to them, I guess. Other questions? Mr. Briggs. A, a question for staff regarding that. For, uh, for, for our recommendations, is something like um, the removal of additional vegetation at the community's request, is that something we have to add as a recommendation? Do we need to weigh on, in on that, or is that just appropriate within the context of the project? Um, well, what do you want to see happen? I guess that's the overriding question. Um, we could leave it th to them, and we might simply say, um, or resolve with staff. I think all the the situation regarding the removal of the alders and any subsequent replacement of shrubs or reseeding shall be um, resolved with planning staff. Um, with permission, um, we're, we're fine working with staff on that a little bit. We're, we know we have to come back to the commission one more time. Um, so that's just something we're more than happy to work with, with staff on. Any other questions? I, I guess I would, uh, I, I just have a, a question, just a graphic question. I, I, I kind of like the trellis treatment that's there and the gateway elements, and I think the danger of sort of repeating that is to make sure that you repeat it at the same quality so that everything gets better. <laughs> um, but I just, the, uh, the, the plan drawing that you've drawn, I guess it's on sheet L5 of that trellis element, um, I must not understand it. it. It looks like you've got wing elements or, or a cross member or something like that on it that I don't see in the elevation. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. Um, those details will be refined as we come back for the, the next. Um, the, um, the original design that was done had um, crossbars. If you look at um, where it says lilac hedge, it, you know, it had those kind of funky things that it, those kind of Japanese-esque. There must be an architectural name for that. Uh, maybe a cloud lift or something like that. <laughs> We originally had those on the trellises, and we weren't happy with them. There was just, it was like Peter's, it was just too much. It was like taking a design and just repeating it and repeating it. So um, what you see when you look at the structure is you see the second design review at our office that said, oh, get rid of those, it's just too much, um, which didn't happen on the plan view. So, so that, there's a discrepancy, and we just, it, we, I think we just need to go out in the field and just get a better feel for, um, they, they seem kind of clunky, the, the original ones are a little bit different proportioned, and um, so it was just a matter of the flying nun things. There's got to be a name for them. Um, but the, so, so we think that we'll refine, as we refine design and work with it, we'll definitely coordinate how those details work out. Okay. So if there's no more questions, I guess it's time for a motion. Mr. Kimmer, move to approve case 2009-015 as meeting the requirements of concept site and landscape plan review for the Urban Design Commission uh, with department recommendations one through five, uh, adding a sixth, consider adding trellis feature to east side of Latouche and Northern Lights to complement the west side. Do you wish to address this issue of additional clearing or? Yes, let's do a, an additional um, item seven uh, to allow the designers to work with staff in regards to additional clearing of alders along the fence alignment uh, near the condominiums. And do you think any additional revision to the language of condition three is necessary? Uh, yes. I guess I would just, uh, 
say consider extending the wall west at the church parking lot uh, if it benefits the intent of the function of the wall and delete station 2900 okay uh, that's been seconded in discussion no any objection to passing the motion seeing hearing none motion passes and that's the last thing on the regular agenda um, we did get an email today regarding the uh, baggage trees. Did everybody get a copy of that, or was that just in? I emailed it to everybody. I'm not sure everyone got it. Unfortunately, <coughs> I managed to forget it on my way out, so I, I couldn't read it to you guys. Uh, I did work with Patricia and Sharon on penning the letter. Uh, that's certainly not to say it, it doesn't uh, need some refinement from from the person who I put their their name down on the bottom that would be the the chair mr. Doherty well I didn't have a chance to review it in detail before I came to the meeting so I, I did want to keep it short uh, Patricia mentioned uh, making sure that it indicated the intent uh, of why we were sending it uh, and and Sharon helped me find that in title 21 that UDC is uh, you know required to bring up issues of urban design to the mayor and the assembly uh, so that's the first paragraph, and then it just goes on to state uh, the, the problem as we saw it and that we would like to avoid it in the future. So uh, it's, I welcome everybody to take a peek at it. And I, and I, I did take a glance at it. My, my question is whether or not we might be, if our charge is to make recommendations to the mayor, this has brought some issues um, to the mayor's attention, but I think it falls short of actually making a recommendation. We did discuss uh, putting a, a monetary number to the damage, uh, which I haven't done simply because I didn't know the number of trees and, and didn't venture a guess. But uh, if that might add some weight to it and I guess we could recommend that, uh, you know, the the school district landscaping specifications uh, require contractors to uh, replace damage plant plant material damaged by moose browse. Yeah, something to that effect, so that Thanks. there's some you know proactive, you know, this is what you can do in the future based on the lesson that we've learned at at Begich. How about the monetary damage? How's that sound to you guys? want to see a dollar figure put to the well, you know that's that's one of the steps I think one of the things we had talked about was a, a more robust uh, warranty specification about what the what the responsibilities of the contractor would be um, one of our frustrations was one of enforcement I think that we we uh, we noted that the project manager maybe rolled over a little too easily on that one but you know you've stated in here that you know, there's an investment that the taxpayers are making in landscaping and in order to sort of protect that and get maximum value, we have to see it through to make sure that it survives. Could, you know, could it at be least. rude of me to say something now? Um, you know, I don't think there's anything that would prevent me from turning the mic on. <laughs> Go ahead. I just want to say with the baggage situation, um, which is appalling, um, it was the um, requirement by the Urban Design Commission that we use trees imported from outside. The cost of that was prohibitive, so the size of the trees had to come down. We think a huge problem there is the size of the trees. And, and so it was this, so, so I guess I just don't want the school district to be blamed for being horrible people, because it was a compromise during the design process that we were, we argued against the selection of, of those trees from coming into the site. So, so I just, 
it's, it's just this mix of things that, that I think is important to, to don't get too pissed off at them because they're, they're like, they're like me and they're like you, they're, we're stuck. Well, we're not, I don't think we're sort of channeling our anger. Okay. What we're doing is sort of looking at a situation that we all sort of had a part, we played a part in, in what ended up happening at Baggage. We're trying to figure out how we can prevent that from happening again. Um, you know, we've reviewed lots of the different details of what happened, and, and, that's and everybody had good intentions. And that's why I make the comments. You know, in my mind, we're starting to get growers out in the valley that are growing great native local stock, and we're also um, reserving forest areas so, so that places that are being cleared, they're starting to do some intermediate clearing of trees between trees when they know a parcel of land is being cleared. So, so there, I guess my only worry is an edict that says use, do not use harvested trees from forest harvested trees or, or, or things, which, which was what kind of happened at Baggage. We were kind of told we don't want you to rape and pillage the local forest. And, and I mean, that was just one of the sidebar discussions. So, so I, well, we haven't gotten to that level of sort of analysis on, on this. I think what our, our issue was is that regardless of what species gets put there, we should protect them against moose browse. And regardless, that, that didn't happen or didn't happen effectively. So, so speaking to what the opportunities are for a, a cash value or something like that, that seems like a really hard thing to do. I think it would be better to be proactive about it and just state that. Um, and, it, you know, at what point do we start to get really prescriptive is, you know, the birch shall be a minimum of three-inch caliper. Or if smaller, shall have moose protection fencing, you know, what do we recommend, or, or in general, trees shall be X caliper or have moose protection? But, uh, you know, I, but I think in, in order for this this commission to inform or recommend things to the mayor, we need to be just clear on what what it is that we learned here, and make a recommendation that that would make things better in the future. That sounds good. I'll work on the letter and send it out. I still have two comments. Month. One, I didn't, I don't remember that there was a trade-off, the trees will be smaller if they're grown in a nursery. <coughs> but second on the letter, and I said this before, I'm not really sold on the value of sending that letter as to the mayor. I mean, I, I recognize the problem and I want to solve it, and it seems like working with the contractors or the school district, I mean, it seems sort of like going to the parent when you go to the mayor, and if it seems like things that go to the mayor should be, we see a trend in a lot of problems and bring up more than one. It, it just seems a little picky to me that we would just pick out of all the things that we see, beg it and pick out that one thing when there were probably a lot of reasons for it. I mean, we've never sent a letter like that, and it seems like even though it's really important, too small of a thing, and especially we're in an interim mayor, we'll have another mayor, and... So I could picture, if our, if our goal is to have the trees live and not be eaten by the moose, I expect the mayor's either not going to do anything, so that didn't help, or he goes to the school district and said, why are you doing this, and they feel picked on, and then the response is wrong. We talked about having a meeting with the school district. I'd way rather work with the school district or people doing it and come up with a plan rather than write a letter to the mayor. This seems heavy-handed to me somehow. And I think the underlying thing is that everybody's trying their best, and there are always these conditions that rise up for when the weird things happen. And it's a good point. Is I mean, we also saw a bad powder coat that day, so maybe we should send a letter to the mayor about yeah. bad powder coat. Um. <laughs> or, you know, the thing with the school district, and the, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things we could do, and it seems like if we had this huge, if we had a lot of things, and we say we see these trends and these things that are costing us money, and we'd like to encourage changes in these five things, but just to go and say the moose ate the trees at Baggage, and then they pruned them poorly, it, it just, to me, seems too little of a thing. Or, or it's not taking it to the right person. Yeah, for the mayor, because the mayor, that you know, that's like you really went to dad or something when you didn't have to, or you went to the principal when you could have talked to the kid or something. Yeah, and I think where that, that stemmed from is that you know, something in our charter says that one of our responsibilities is to make recommendations to the mayor. And we saw a whole chain of things that didn't go right in this project, and we wanted to have somebody that we could sort of 
you know, aim our lessons learned at? You know, is that a is that a committee? Is that a a, 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 a mandatory condition on all of these things? You know, we don't know. But I think we we came away from that as sort of wanting to do something yeah. uh, as a result of what we've learned on this. And I think this already is covered in, in the, the specifics of this are covered is in typical specifications that talks about having a strong single leader. So I mean, that's already covered, but this appeared to be a worst case scenario where they went to smaller plant material, got much by moose, the school district took responsibility for it. Or I think someone even mentioned they don't have a warranty period. The school district takes on the warranty. Didn't somebody say that? I think so, because they didn't replace them. Because we asked, don't they have to replace them after a year? And they said they didn't. So there was a series of things. And I don't think it's the size of the trees, because tell the truth, those trees were the nicest birch I've seen planted mm -hmm. on a public project. I went out and looked at them. Mm -hmm. They were some of the few trees that got planted that had a nice form, or obviously from a nursery, and had been grown like a birch tree ought to be grown. We're so used to seeing the tall, skinny things. So I don't question if you plant a bigger tree, but a bigger tree doesn't mean a tree with no branches that's bigger. So. Mm -hmm. The trees were nice, and the problem was not having them protected. And if we had been told we can't protect them if we buy a high-quality tree because we don't have enough money left, or the contractor's not going to replace them, or I don't think we had all those things like, oh, well, if we do this, then we're not going to do that. And, and I didn't know there was ever not a warranty for a year. So, If I remember the previous discussion correctly, I think our first impulse was to send the letter to the school district, and we thought that maybe not appropriate that we should send it to the mayor and the assembly, as it says in, in you know, Title 21, and then we decided to send it to, to the mayor and the assembly. But, you know, I'm in favor of sending a letter to somebody, and, and I think we should have some dollar figure in here, because otherwise the scope of what happened doesn't come across. I mean, if this was worth $350,000, then that gets somebody's attention of what's been lost. Or we have to put the number of trees that, was, that were damaged. But there has to be something concrete in here so that they understand, understand the scope of what happened. Um, and maybe we ought to take some pictures of what, that technique so they can understand when we say, you know, it would, they bent up the upper limbs to try and form a new leader. You know, that makes sense to them once they can see the, the pictures. But I think perhaps the letter should, we should send it to the mayor and the assembly and say that we want to have a follow-up discussion with the school district to resolve this um, and, you know, discuss it further and make sure it doesn't happen again. And maybe that should be in the letter also. And then we CC the school district on this. But I have a question as to whether it was a singular incidence. And, you know, if we do bring it up with them, it's kind of getting, you know... I don't know of another time. situation where this has happened. So that, and that's what I'm saying. With a singular incidence for this, a more proactive for us would be, and in, in, in Elise maybe brought up a good point, where, you know, everybody was partly to blame. So for us, because we have our standard conditions on a plant, is it one of the standard conditions we should have that, you know, planting uh, is provided with adequate moose protection? Right. Whether that's large caliper or fencing, or they say it's not needed in this area, somehow they prove to us, and by them doing that, if it gets, you know, then the condition on that is if it is damaged by moose, it will be replaced. And that goes back to working with school district and their own specifications, which, you know, say something about they may be replaced, but only at the discretion of the school district. And, I mean, that's crazy. But it's within our purview to make it a, um, one of the staff recommendations. Yeah, and at least then we have it in there. And if they don't do it, then I think we have more of a thing to say when we make recommendations to the school district that would result in healthy landscapes and saving money. They're not following them instead of the one thing. I, I just like to focus more on solving the problem, and I'd rather talk with the people in this instance. Because we've had a lot of times when Moose ate things. It's not the first time. I, it just, I, I see maybe it'll get elevated to a point we can't talk with the school district like we could without going to the mayor, and we don't solve the issue. So I would rather start lower and work our way up. If it doesn't work, then... And, and I, I guess I question whether it's our purview to have that discussion. It's our purview to make the recommendation to the mayor, but perhaps right. another hat. To, it's Forestry's hat to talk to the school district or something like that. I, that, that would be my question. Maybe well, the new... Uh, forester. The Forester. Yes. Scott Stringer. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's the avenue is how you get this municipal forester to work in partnership with the school district to get a common goal and objective. 
and now, for, and now, for what we're looking for in school district specifications for landscaping. But I think using I this and maybe, you know, all of the events that led up to this as an example of, you know, the system that we have right now isn't quite working. Or, or we start with the assumption the school district is doing their best and we bring up this one condition and ask how we can stop this one instance of it going wrong from happening again. Because I think generally they are good with their landscaping. Well, you know, I was surprised when I looked and I can't remember which project again it was, but I could look, but it was one we looked at tonight. I think it was one of the finals where Lisa again was going to use plant skid. She wasn't going to um, fence in the trees. And that's the one where I put the condition on it that, you know, that the contractor is responsible and it's going to have to do the pan the um, the fencing around it and replace the trees if they're damaged. But again, Elise was just going to use plant skids, so it, the message is not getting through. Well, we got to put and her specifications like were that. just the same thing that they'll be replaced at the discretion of the school district. So nothing has changed. Uh, one of the ways that the commission does have uh, to address these type of issues is to, um, you know, have a, you know, a work session, you know, on a particular topic. And if this is an issue that, um, you know, relative to the school district and would benefit by having the municipal forester participate in the dialogue, then it would seem to me that um, having the commission, you know, request a work session put, be put together, you know, with you know, some of the major players and kind of you know, talk it over and talk it out and, and see, you know, what type of, uh, you know, solutions we can develop, you know, at that level without having to go all the way up to the big policymaker. Then I would also say including um, somebody, whoever's responsible for the mass specifications as well, it, <coughs> just to have it as being a general work session on uh, tree installation standards and details. Then the significance of baggage is that we've seen something go wrong, uh, and it's not, it's not, What's bad about Begich? It's a, you know, a, a case study, and if why a work session of this type is necessary at this time. We can have pictures. I took pictures of those. We can have pictures of that and other things to say. Here's what happened, and I think we should have the cost. We know the installation cost, and that value's gone. So. And you know they're nursery-grown birch, and what would they but cost? They a thousand. We know the size of them, so. Eight hundred to a thousand, and there were a bunch of them that are. Gone. Oh yeah. Plus, I don't, you know, they spent time, and I expect it was a contractor who came and said, "Oh, I can fix those," and they, they thought, "Well, they must know since they're the contractor." So the letter, we could send out a letter, but instead of to the mayor, it could be to the parties um, that have been mentioned, uh, and you know, asking them to participate in a work session to, you know, address um, the case example of that figage and to, you know, explore ways of. Um, uh, dealing with you know, some of the uh, uh, landscape you know, maintenance concerns that have come before, have, have come to the attention of the Urban Design Commission. But I don't think it's attribution to start writing letters to all the people. No? We might have either charter say we need to make recommendations to the mayor, that's it. We don't have any right to send the letter to anybody else. That will be my opinion. But well, we can do a joint session for everybody's benefit, a work session. Well, our recommendation to the mayor might be to have this work session. Yeah, and that's, that would that's be okay. More proactive. Yeah, it, see, that's a big enough level to say we'd like to work with the school district and solve problems. That seems more appropriate than saying mm -hmm. they prune the trees wrong. Yeah, kind of small potatoes for what's on the mayor's plate, right? And the mayor will just pass this on to one of their assistants and... Well, we, yeah. could rec we could recommend who the attendees of a work session would be and he could alert them. Mm -hmm. I can see that happening. Otherwise, I think he'll get the letter and it'll go under the stack of things that he doesn't get to in the next three months. Mm -hmm. So who would the attendees be? The school district? Mm-hmm. The, the urban I can forester. I can look up who were the project manager who was the project manager for that and then um, probably Ray Amston and Mike Price and maybe at least because she does so many school district projects right and then um, also Scott the new forester and I think the Muni people as well because it, I think we should address it at a city level and between Mass and the ASV specs that covers 
mm -hmm. all the public facilities pretty much, doesn't it? I had another idea. We could sponsor a competition for a low-cost uh, aesthetic um, moose browse protection system for landscaping. You know, I let, think that let kids and designers and stuff come up with some ideas on how to solve this thing. I think that black mesh works really, really well. It's practically invisible. Fast Except I saw it all wound up in one of those really expensive snow blowers last spring. <laughs> well, with the exception of that. So I'll work on the letter and send it out. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a mark. I like the job. full draft deck. This is a great comment. Back to the writing session. board. It'll be short now, though. It'll just be good. No, I, I, I think that's a lot of good comments. So uh, I will put something together and get it to you before the next meeting instead of the day of the meeting. So segueing into the next meeting, I got a, 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 a late notice of a meeting on Monday coming up. Yeah, the joint work session. I guess I have to put, that on? put myself in the same category as Commissioner Coleman. I already have something scheduled for that evening. How about the rest of you? I, I do as well, unfortunately. I can come, but I still agree with that isn't much notice <coughs> through four yeah. days. Yeah. I'm with Patricia, so I can attend, but it is short. I can come. I can come. Okay. Remind me again, what's, what's the topic of the work session? It was, oh, and the new section of Title 21, or one of those sections of Title 21 that deals with, uh, was it single family, townhouses, and duplexes, and the design standards for those. Is it going to be another presentation by Yeah, staff? yeah, I think uh, it, it will be a pres presentation format. Okay. Hmm? Okay. So UDC will be looking at more than just the landscaping? Aspect. Oh, yeah, you're going to be looking at buildings and what they're planning for the design standards for those. Is now a good time for two questions? And Sharon, do we need to keep the Walmart? That's a good question. I think um, we talked about that today, but I think the design is going to change significantly. And, and so I'm going to have to rewrite the staff report, and I think the drawings are going to change as well. So I think you can ditch those. Okay. A, a question on our packages. It seems that um, the packages normally have a duplicate of the plan set between the 8.5 by 11 and 11 by 17. Is it yeah. possible to save the paper? She, I think she's doing that so the people, you know, the packets out here that they ha can see, you know, for the public to come in, they've got, you know, a small version of that. I can <laughs> mention it to her. Okay. And that then, you guys don't need, to, need that. Um, a second question on standard notes as well. Um, per Francis's comment number four that he had had on the one case that, I, that I'd asked about where he said it has to be in compliance with the sim set they'd normally submitted. I'm sorry, can you start again? <laughs> that made no sense at all. And it, I made a comment on it during the case. It was 2009-010, where his comment number four said that the, uh, they are in compliance with the submittal that they've just made. Um, it makes sense in a way to have a, something like that. Do we need that on all of our cases as a recommendation? I, it's normal to do that on all the final, um, final reviews that says, you know, that they have to be in compliance with this. And that's just boilerplate. That's on everything. Every, okay. every. I don't, I don't remember seeing that condition. Oh, yeah, out. there should be on almost every Maybe one of them for final. Are there final ones this evening? You know, when I do final and I say prepared by, and then I put sheet number, blah, blah, sheet number, and I do all that. That's the same thing. It has to be in compliance with the narrative, okay. the application, and, and the submittal, all the sheets. And it's not you know, making fun of Francis or anything like that. I just did not remember that. Okay. Usually it's the first condition, and he put it last, so that might Maybe. throw you off. I think that's what's throwing you off. I never read all those numbers at the top. <laughs> you have anything else for us? No. Any other discussion items or a motion? Move to adjourn. <coughs> it's been seconded. Any opposition? No. We're adjourned.
Well, and I think, um, Jill wanted you all to check your addresses and phone numbers and all that to make sure it's still correct. And if, if not, let her know. 